today uh, again i am going to discuss vibrational spectroscopy so in the last lecture we looked at how to calculate uh, energy of vibrational levels and what are the selection rule uh, in this lecture i will just first go through recap of the last lecture and then i will discuss raman vibrational spectroscopy and application of ir spectroscopy for various purpose in various industry and uh, in various applications when we solved the schrodinger equation for vibrational or harmonic oscillator what we got is a wave function a wave function is given by this formula where nv is normalization uh, factor and then you have a hermite polynomial and multiplied by your exponential minus alpha x square by 2 so this is your allowed wave function for vibrational level nv is given by this formula and then alpha is in terms of reduced mass and force constant you can also calculate energy of various vibrational levels and that is given by your v plus half h nu or v plus half h bar omega so nu is your frequency and omega is angular frequency we also discussed in the last lecture about selection rule for vibrational spectroscopy uh, there are two uh, selection rules one which is known as gross selection rule which tells that electric dipole moment of molecule must change when the atoms are displaced relative to one another so during the vibration electric dipole moment of molecule must change then only it can so your vibrational spectroscopy and the second is a specific selection rule which tells you that transition is only allowed when delta v is equal to plus minus 1 for homonuclear diatomic molecule we discuss that uh, vibration doesn't create change in your dipole moment electrical dipole moment so homonuclear diatomic molecules cannot be studied through ir spectroscopy molecule without a permanent dipole moment can be studied if there is a variation of uh, dipole moment with the displacement and this dis variation can start from zero for example in co2 molecule uh, certain vibrational modes are ir active because your permanent dipole moment can change on the displacement the application of your vibrational spectroscopy in the calculation of dissociation energy so we have already looked at what will be the energy of different vibrational levels when we consider your anharmonic oscillator so for that your energy is given by v plus half sc omega e minus v plus half square xc sc omega e and plus higher energy term higher energy term when we divide this energy term by sc we will get energy a vibrational level in wave number unit in wave number unit and that will be given by v plus half omega e minus v plus half square xc omega e plus higher wave number term higher wave number term now one of the way to calculate w e and x e omega e is, is g v plus 1 is energy of v plus 1 level in wave number unit minus g v is the energy of v level in wave number unit when you subtract or when you take difference between these two values these two terms what you will get is wave number of transition between level v to v plus 1 to v plus 1 and that can be obtained from vibrational spectroscopy experimental uh, experimentally you can obtain that and when you plot that versus v plus 1 what do you expect that it will give you a straight line with intercept omega e and slope minus 2 omega e xc so this is written here now you see that if you plot this 
versus V plus 1, your intercept will be omega e and slope will be minus 2 x e omega e. And that can be used to calculate your d e which is dissociation energy and the equation for this is given here. Now, we will discuss in the next slide how we can obtain this relation. So, there are two different kind of dissociation energy. One is the difference of energy of vibrational level where the energy is maximum and your 0, whereas the second is your d 0 which is the energy difference between this and your v is equal to 0, energy corresponding to v is equal to 0. Now, to calculate v max and corresponding energy, what we will do is we will simply differentiate this energy term with respect to v, with respect to v. So, we expect that that will give you value of v max or value of v where energy is maximum, value of v where energy is maximum. When you do that, when you differentiate this equation 1 with v, what you are going to get is S c omega e minus 2 v plus half x c e s c omega e, higher terms are neglected and that should be equal to 0 if we want to know the V level where energy is maximum. And when we do that, what we will get is V is equal to 1 by 2 x c minus half, minus half and this is the V max. Again V max is the vibrational level whose energy is maximum, whose energy is maximum. Okay, so, E V max or which is basically known as D E is basically obtained by putting this V value in E V, in E V. Now, you see that V plus half is equal to 1 by 2 x e. So, what you have to do is you just replace this V plus half by 1 by 2 x e. When you do that, what you will get is d e or e v max energy of the maximum energy of vibrational level where your energy is maximum is your 1 by 2 x e for v plus half s c omega e minus 1 by 2 x e square x e s c omega e. So, this is basically omega e by 2 x e s c minus if you simplify this, what you are going to get is omega e by 4 x e h c, 4 x e h c which corresponds to omega e by 4 x e into h c. So, this is the way to calculate d e and d e is, is basically your uh, maximum energy or energy of the uh, vibrational level which corresponds to maximum energy, which corresponds to maximum energy. So, your d is if you remember that d is equal to omega e square by 4 x e omega e and here you can simply multiply there at numerator by omega e uh, and uh, divide by uh, omega e then it will be omega e square by 4 x e omega e, 4 x e omega e and that can be calculated by the previously shown plot. So, this is the way you can calculate d e in wave number unit. So, this is d e in your energy unit and if you divide by s c then you will get d e in wave number unit. So, d e is given by omega e square by 4 x e omega e s c. This is in your uh, energy unit whereas, if you divide by s c you will get d in wave number unit and uh, so this is your d in wave number unit and if you subtract that by e naught which is the energy of energy of v is equal to 0 or 0 point energy then what you will get is or known as your 
d 0. So, d 0 is equal to simply d e minus e naught and if you see here, so this is your energy of the vibrational level v, uh, energy of vibrational level v where energy is maximum and this is your d e whereas d e minus this uh, 0 point energy, energy corresponding to v is equal to 0 will give you d 0 value. So, till now we discussed vibrational spectroscopy of diatomic molecule, now we will discuss vibrational spectroscopy of polyatomic molecules. So, if you uh, go for polyatomic molecule, first thing you need to understand is what in the normal modes. So, if there is n atoms in a molecule, there will be 3 n possible movements and uh, each, uh, so every atom moving in one of the three direction x, y, z. So, there is three n possible movements. Out of that, three are translational movements. So, all atoms in the molecule moving in x, y, z direction at the same time. And so, you have a three translational movement. So, out of three n, you have a three translational movement and three rotational movement, three rotational movements around x, y or z axis. So, out of 3 n now 3 is accounted for translational movement, 3 are accounted for rotational movement. So, left one is your 3 n minus 6 movements and that is your normal modes of vibration in a molecule, in a polyatomic molecule. For linear molecule, they are a bit exceptions because two axes that perpendicular to molecular axis are identical and that is why they have only two rotational degree of uh, two rotational movements and so uh, total normal modes of vibration for a linear molecule is 3 n minus 5. All vibrational movements of the sample can be described as linear combination of vibrational normal modes. Now, let us think about water, these are the three different normal modes of vibration, one is your symmetric stretching. So, everything is going in one direction. The vibration of symmetric S 2 S stretching is around 36 57 centimeter inverse. Then you have a asymmetric S 2 O stretching means one is going in this direction, the other will. The movement of other bond will not be symmetric, it will be just in opposite direction and so you have a symmetric S 2 S stretching which uh, have vibration around 1595 centimeter inverse and the last one is your the bending vibration and that happens around your 3756 centimeter inverse. Here in this you can see there are several different molecule and their vibrational wave number is given. For example, SCL symmetric stretching, so it has only one kind of stretching. So, that is symmetrical stretching and your a wave number is 2991 centimeter inverse. Similarly, HF molecule. So, for diatomic molecule, you only have one normal mode of vibration and uh, for HF, it is 4139 centimeter inverse. For H2O, you have a three different kind of vibration. We just discussed about that. One is symmetric, another is asymmetric stretching and then your uh, symmetric bending and this value we have already seen. For ammonia, there can be four different kind of uh, vibration apart from symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching, symmetrical bending. You have asymmetrical bending which happens around 1689.7 centimeter inverse. Similarly, you can go for uh, go and calculate for other kind of molecules what will be the normal mode of vibration. The simple rule is for polyatomic molecule which is not linear polyatomic molecule which is not linear. You have a non-linear molecule basically you have 3 n minus 6 movements or 3 n minus 6 normal mode of vibration. For linear molecule you have 3 n minus 5 modes of vibration. So, for example, for SCL you are going to have SCL has 2 atoms. So, 3 n minus 5 comes out to be 1 and that is what we saw in the case of 
HF and HCl. So, diatomic molecules uh, are going to have only one normal mode of vibration. For H2O, it is triatomic molecule and it is a nonlinear, so 3n minus 6, so 3 normal mode of vibration. For ammonia, you have your 4 atoms, so 3n minus 6, 4 into 3 minus 6, so there are going to be 6 different kind of vibrations. Selection rules for polyatomic molecules is similar to what we discussed for diatomic molecules, but for polyatomic molecules some normal mode of vibration are IR active where others are not. A gross selection rule is applicable here also. So, displacements of a normal mode must cause a change in the dipole moment, only then you can see the IR spectra of that molecule and then a specific selection rule is similar, delta V is plus minus 1. So, now we will go to uh, Raman spectroscopy, so Raman vibrational and then we will discuss Raman rotational vibrational spectroscopy. So, when light falls on a material, we know that how EMR electromagnetic radiation interacts with uh, your sample, light can be transmitted. Uh, light can undergo your luminescence, light can get absorbed and a scattering can happen. A scattering is also of two types, elastic scattering and inelastic scattering. So, Raman spectroscopy is basically complementary to IR spectroscopy. Radiation at a certain frequency is scattered by the molecule, the shift in wavelength of the incident beam. It resembles IR absorption spectra, spectrum, but mechanism differs. In IR spectroscopy, your particle is moving from one vibrational level to another vibrational level. In the Raman spectroscopy, when you excite the molecule, it goes to some virtual state and from the virtual state, it comes back to one of the vibrational state. So, V double dash is equal to 1 by a scattering. So, you can see gap is still remains same, gap is still remains same. This is the difference between IR and Raman. We are looking at the vibrational modes only, but in IR change in dipole is important, whereas in Raman spectroscopy uh, change in polarizability is important. We have already discussed uh, Raman a bit in uh, rotational Raman spectroscopy. So, I am not going to tell you in the detail, but we know that a change in polarizability is important for Raman spectroscopy. Here excitation of molecules happen to excited vibrational uh, state, whereas in Raman spectroscopy momentary distortion of electron distributed in the uh, bond. And uh, here asymmetric vibrations are active. Only asymmetric vibrations are active, particularly for triatomic linear molecule. Here, your symmetric vibrations are also active. So, basic principle of Raman spectroscopy is light is scattered by the sample at various angles by momentary absorption to virtual state and then emission. So, absorption molecule does not go to a vibrational level, it goes to a virtual state and that is what it is seen here. So, no change in electronic state. So, first it must be kept in mind that in Raman spectroscopy there is no change in electronic state. We are going from this ground state to a virtual state and there are infinite number of virtual state, it can go anywhere. So, these are two virtual states you can see here. So, first during excitation it goes to this, excitation can also take a molecule or a particle from a vibrational state 1 to this virtual state and then, so this is your ground electronic state and there are this four vibrational state. So, from first vibrational state it can go to your some another virtual state and if suppose on absorption it goes from 0 to this virtual state, it comes back to same ground state, then you say that it is a Rayleigh scattering. Emission energy is equal to 
your H nu excitation. In this case, in Raman scattering, what happens that it does not come back to same vibrational level. It is now coming back if you compare between this one and your this one, it starts from excitation is from 0 vibrational state to this suppose this is virtual V 1 state, V 1 and this is V 2 state. So, uh, excitation is from 0 vibrational state to V 1 virtual state and if you see it is coming back from V 1 virtual state to V is equal to 1 vibrational level not to V is equal to 0. So, E is going to be less and E is energy of emission is going to be H nu excitation minus delta E and delta E is basically this difference, difference between V is equal to 0 vibrational level and V is equal to 1 vibrational level, V is equal to 1 vibrational level. In anti stocks, so if you see here that there is excitation, the second excitation is from V is equal to 1 to virtual state V 2, but when it is coming back, it is going from V 2 to your V is equal to 0. So, here E is higher than H nu excitation and that is higher by delta E amount and this is called anti stock lines. So, you have a two different kind of lines, a stock line and anti stock line. Some scattered emission occur at the same energy while other return to a different state. If it happens at the same energy, then you say that this is Rayleigh scattering where H nu in is equal to H nu out. Whereas, uh, in Raman spectroscopy, your there is a net change of energy and H nu in can be either less than H nu out or can be greater than H nu out. In one case, you say that is a Stokes line and the, in the second one, you say that is anti stocks line. So, resulting a spectrum you can see a stocks line is this where your E is less than E excitation whereas, in anti stocks line where E is greater than N your. So, if you see frequency for anti stocks frequency is going to be higher and that is going to be new excitation plus new V whereas, for a stocks line you have a smaller frequency which is new excitation minus new of vibrational level V. Probability of emission is directly proportional to observed intensity and uh, Rayleigh scattering is quite greater than stocks and then less than anti stocks. So, let us discuss about vibrational Raman spectra. Uh, theory is almost same as um, rotational Raman spectra. So, uh, when monochromatic radiations falls on a molecular sample in gas phase and is not absorbed by it, oscillating electric field of radiation induces electric dipole in the molecule which is given by mu is equal to alpha into E, where alpha is your polarizability. Generally, the electric field oscillating electric field is given by this equation is equal to A sin 2 pi C nu bar into T where C is velocity of light and nu bar is the wave number, V nu bar is the wave number. So, now let us think about how to express the polarizability. There is a difference between representation of polarizability in rotational spectrum in comparison to your vibrational spectrum. So, there is a difference between two different kind of motions. So, in the rotational spectrum, alpha is given by this equation, where alpha 0 r is polarizability when uh, at the equilibrium position plus alpha 1 r multiplied by sin 2 pi c multiplied by 2 into nu bar rotation and then multiplied by t. So, this term is significant. If you go for vibration, you will get alpha is equal to alpha 0 v you can say 0 v alpha 1 v sin 2 pi c omega into t, where omega is again wave number, wave number, but this is wave number of vibration and this is wave, wave number of rotation. One thing you will notice that 
in this case it is multiplied by 2 whereas in this case it is multiplied by 1. Now question is why. So let us think about a rotation of your O2 molecule and what we have done is we have taken 116 O and this is 18 oxygen. So this molecule when it is in this position this is your the dipole moment and when it comes to horizontal position 18 O goes this side. So, rotation is like this. So, 18 O 16 O then your dipole moment will decrease. Now, again rotate by 90 degree what you will get is 18 O up and 16 O down. So, again your uh, dipole moment increases. Then on further rotation this 18 O will come here, 16 O will come here. So, you we are talking about this kind of rotation. Okay. So, 18 O will come here, 16 O will, 16 o will uh, go here. In this condition also there is a decrease in uh, induced dipole moment and then this is the position on further 90 degree rotation what you will get is 16 O up and 18 O down and then you have higher dipole moment, higher dipole moment. So, now you see here that you started from this molecule and you are ending up with the same molecule and this requires 360 degree rotation, 360 degree rotation. Now let us look at how dipole moment is changing during this 360 degree rotation. At this position it is up then down and it is up here. So, what does that mean is during one 360 degree rotation it is going from first crest to third crest. So, first, second, third crest and what does that mean is it is completing two cycles, it is completing two cycles. So, so during 360 degree rotation two cycles gets completed and that is why your wave number is written like 2 into nu bar rotation. Whereas, during the vibration now look at vibration what is happening 16 O 18 O. So, this is one complete vibration, this is your equilibrium position, this is your extension, equilibrium position, compression and then your equilibrium position and then extension or stretching. So, you started with a stretching, you went to equilibrium position, you compressed it, you again went to equilibrium position and finally your molecule is uh, this bond is stressed. So, now you have gone from this position to this position. Now you see if I plot this dipole induced by field during this one vibration what I will get is here your dipole moment is higher, dipole moment is smaller dipole moment is smaller, dipole moment is higher and this is dipole moment is highest. So, you are seeing that you started from one crest and you went to the another crest. So, from stressed mode to stressed mode you are completing one cycle, only one cycle um, in contrast to the rotation where 360 degree rotation corresponds to 2 cycle. So, here you do not write 2 omega, you write omega where omega is wave number for wave number for vibration. So, if you multiply mu by E what you are going to get is 3 different terms and this I already explained you in the rotational Raman spectroscopy uh, when wave number is your nu plus omega then you have anti Stokes lines, when it is nu minus omega then you have Stokes line. So, these are the different terms alpha 0 v, I told you that corresponds to average polarizability during vibration, alpha 1 v is amplitude of change of polarizability due to vibration, A is amplitude of oscillating electric field of incident radiation nu bar is wave number of incident radiation 
and omega is vibrational wave number. So, in the case of vibrational Raman spectrum, you again get two lines anti stocks stocks along with your rally line and uh, the frequency wave number here corresponds to v plus omega and v minus omega uh, uh, v minus omega now we can discuss about selection rule for vibrational spectroscopy alpha is the polarizability and alpha is also a function of x alpha can be given as alpha e plus d alpha by d x e x plus 1 by 2 factorial d 2 alpha by d x at equilibrium into x square. So, this kind of calculation we have seen for vibrational spectroscopy, same thing we are going to do it here. If we calculate vibrational Raman transition, the first terms when we put in the this R v first term is going to be 0, because there are two vibrational levels v and v plus 1 wave function of two vibrational levels are orthogonal to each other. So, first term will uh, tends to 0, second term will remain whereas, third term we can neglect for a small displacement. So, vibrational Raman transition moment can be given by this equation R v is equal to your d alpha by d x c and this integral multiplied by this integral. So, your polarizability alpha which is polarizability must change with x if it is Raman active and uh, so this is one selection rule and the second one uh, gives you delta v is equal to plus minus 1. So, first term is not 0 when polarizability changes with your uh, displacement whereas, second term will not be equal to 0 when delta v is equal to plus minus 1. So, there are two selection rule, uh, delta v plus minus 1 is called a specific selection rule, whereas first one is known as gross selection rule. After this, now we know that Raman can be of two type, pure rotational Raman and pure vibrational Raman. We have already discussed pure rotational Raman and in this lecture, we discussed pure vibrational Raman spectroscopy. For vibrational, for rotational there are three different rules, delta j is equal to 0 plus minus 2 for linear molecule, for symmetric top delta j is equal to 0 plus minus 2 and delta k is equal to 0. For asymmetric top your delta j can be 0 plus minus 1 and plus minus 2 whereas, delta k must be 0. So, this is the selection rule for rotational, for vibrational then we have selection rule is delta v is equal to plus minus 1. We can also know intensity of Raman line and we just calculated uh, rotational Raman transition moment and that is given by this equation. Intensity is proportional to R v square and so by looking at how R v changes, we can tell about intensity of Raman lines. So, this is how alpha changes with x, alpha changes with x and so uh, depending on slope you can say position and the slope at that position you can calculate what will be the uh, d alpha by d x square and uh, that is basically proportional to your intensity. In contrast to vibrational spectroscopy what we can see is that this d alpha by d r is mostly positive and it does not vary that much with r, it does not vary that much with r. What does that mean is that vibrational Raman intensity are less sensitive than infrared intensities uh, to the environment of the molecule such as solvent. So, please keep that thing in mind a peak is more intense based on delta v is equal to plus minus 1, you also need to look at how polarizability changes with the distance and that also determines your intensity of the peak. If you look at uh, infrared Raman spectroscopy for diatomic molecule, you uh, will have your three different kind of 
transition. So, this is for diatomic. So, you see S is equal to your here you are going from for example, take this case we are going from V double dash is equal to 5 to V double dash V dash is equal to 7. So, again delta J is plus minus 2 we are going from your rotational level of 1 vibration to rotational level uh, to rotational level of another vibrational level ok and so this is rotational vibrational Raman rotational vibrational Raman and uh, this can be of three types uh, what is known as S Q and uh, so this is your S type and this is Q and this is O you see here in S you are going from 5 to 7 5 to 7 so delta J plus 2 delta J is plus 2 here you see you are going from 7 to 5. So, this side you have delta j is minus 2 and in this case you are going from same place 7 to 7. So, delta j is 0. So, delta j is 0 corresponds to q peak where delta j is equal to plus 2 corresponds to s and delta j is equal to minus 2 corresponds to your o peak. We know that energy of vibrational rotational levels, we have already discussed that and that is basically G V plus F, uh, V J and that is given by this equation. And now, we can apply delta J is equal to plus minus 2 to know what should be the wave number for your S transition, O transition and so you see this is if I neglect uh, an harmonicity and if I neglect your uh, centrifugal distortion, then we have two uh, different uh, part, one corresponding to vibrational, another corresponding to your rotational level. And then you can calculate new bar or wave number for S, O and Q transition, S, O and Q transition. And here you can see that this is not going to change because your delta V is plus minus 1 and when Raman rotational vibrational spectroscopy, but delta J is going to be your plus 2. So, this is for delta J is equal to plus 2 and for that the wave number is given by omega naught plus 4 B J plus 6 B, omega naught plus 4 J plus 6 B. And then you can also calculate wave number for O transition is delta J is equal to minus 2, minus 2 and this is delta J is equal to 0, delta J is equal to 0. So, for O you will have this omega naught minus 4 B J plus 2 B and for this you have omega naught. So, you can see that, so this is your Q and this is O and this is S. So, these are the three different kind of transition in rotational vibrational Raman spectroscopy. So, intensity of normal Raman peak, uh, just we discussed about intensity, uh, how we can calculate, we have to look at how polarizability changes uh, with x that also tells you about intensity. Apart from that, intensity of the source, the concentration of active group will increase your uh, intensity of the peaks. The power of Raman emission increases with the fourth power of the frequency of the source and Raman intensity are usually directly proportional to the concentration of the active space. So, there are two other things which uh, decides about intensity, one is power of the source and the second is concentration of active space. So, let us first understand what we mean by volume of ellipsoid and polarizability. It is important to understand polarizability because then you can understand how a molecule is Raman active, vibrational Raman active or not. Polarizability of molecule is generally represented at ellipsoid and volume of ellipsoid is inversely proportional to a square root of alpha where alpha is polarizability. So, what does that mean is? that if you look at this 
ellipsoid. So, in this direction your volume is less whereas, in this direction your volume is more. So, this is your minor axis and this is your major axis. So, what does that mean is in this direction your polarizability is more, polarizability is more, your polarizability is high or more. Whereas, in this direction vertical direction your polarizability is less since volume is proportional to 1 by root alpha where alpha is polarizability. So, if volume is less it means polarizability is high. And now, you compare between these two volume of ellipsoid and you can tell that in this your polarizability is high, polarizability is high, it is high, polarizability is high. Now, let us think about if suppose I am looking at uh, CO2 and I want to know whether different vibrational mode of CO2 is uh, Raman active or not, Raman active or not. CO2 has three fundamental vibrational mode. So, since CO2 is has three atoms, so 3 n minus 6 is 3. So, it has three fundamental vibrational mode one is symmetric symmetric stretching mode and that is shown here shown here so this is a molecule and you are basically stretching uh, these two bond so extension this side this so stretching is happening so when stretching happens you get this uh, when contraction happens you get this uh, molecule so both bonds are getting stressed here both bonds are getting compressed. So, if that happens you see that the molecule has symmetrical stretching mode. The second kind of mode is bending mode and here you can see that this is the normal molecule and if you take both up then you will get this one, if you take both down then you will get this one. So, this is your bending mode and uh, the third one is a symmetric stretching mode in that one bond is one bond is getting stressed uh, while other bond is getting compressed so in this case this bond elongated this bond get compressed while in this case this uh, is compressed and this one is elongated so you have three fundamental vibrational modes of co2 ideally all are Raman active because you can see that there is a change in polarizability. But uh, in reality this asymmetric stretching and bending are Raman inactive. Now, let us first think about what is happening to polarizability. So, here you see you are stretching this bond, what does that mean is that uh, the electron cloud is more polarizable since uh, since there is a greater distance between nuclei and electron cloud. Uh, so, you will see that volume of ellipsoid is volume of polarizability ellipsoid is smaller whereas, in the contraction case polarizability is more what does that mean volume of ellipsoid is going to be large going to be large. Similar is the case with this uh, uh, bending mode. In bending mode you can see that here your cloud is elongated what does that mean is polarizability along the major axis is major axis is smaller whereas, in this case polarizability along this direction is higher compared to this CO2. Same thing here polarizability along this axis is higher compared to uh, your uh, normal molecule or molecule in equilibrium position. Now, the third case asymmetric stretching mode. So, you can see here that in this case your polarizability is higher in the equilibrium where 
in the uh, this one uh, polarizability is going to be a smaller. So, polarizability is polarizability is uh, greater in the CO2 in equilibrium mode polarizability is smaller along this axis along this axis if you do asymmetric stretching and same case is here. So, it looks like that polarizability is changing, but in reality uh, we will see that in the last two cases polarizability does not change. So, for that what we need to do is we need to look at change in polarizability with displacement coordinates. So, to understand why the other two modes are Raman inactive, what we need to see is we need to look at change in polarizability with displacement coordinates. So, what I mean by displacement coordinates that for a stretching motion it is a measure of extension and compression of the bond under consideration. Whereas, for bending motion it is a measure of displacement of bond angle from its equilibrium value. So, what I mean is uh, that plus and minus value of E refers to opposite displacement direction. Once we know that let us see the plot. So, this is plot for symmetrical stretching mode and you can see that uh, your epsilon is plotted against alpha and now you see this is your uh, equilibrium position. So, you are at this point and now what you are looking at what happens when you compress the bonds or stretch the bonds. So, this is your stretching and you can see that stretching what happens we are going towards plus E and plus E here your volume ellipsoid is smaller and polarizability is higher. So, you can see this polarizability is increasing. When you do compression what you mean is you are looking at uh, this side negative side negative side of extension and you can see that your volume of ellipsoid is larger it means polarizability is smaller and so polarizability is uh, dropping with the compression with the compression. So, if you look at this point uh, what you will see is near equilibrium position if you look at a small displacement it has a slope. So, you can see that there is a slope there is a slope. What does that mean is your for a small displacement motion changes polarizability and thus the symmetrical stretching mode is Raman active. Now, let us think about bending mode. So, I already discussed that this is your equilibrium position and your polarizability is going to be smaller and volume of ellipsoid is larger. So, now you are looking at plus e minus e. So, when you do suppose displacement in this direction which is basically here what you see is volume of ellipsoid decreasing it means polarizability is increasing. So, polarizability is increasing. Now, if you look at this case where what we are doing is we are bending both C O towards downward and and in that case again volume of ellipsoid is decreasing, volume of ellipsoid is decreasing and that means polarizability is increasing. So, you basically get this kind of curve when you plot alpha versus E. Now, if you go at equilibrium position and try to draw a slope for a small displacement what you will see that your slope is slope is 0 what does that mean is d alpha by d e is equal to 0. So, basically for a small displacement there is no effective change in polarizability and therefore, bending mode is Raman inactive bending mode is Raman inactive. Now, let us think about the third case asymmetric stretching mode in this again your equilibrium position you have in equilibrium position you have a smaller ellipsoid what does that mean that alpha value is higher and if you do asymmetric 
stretching uh, what does that mean it extension of this bond and compression of this bond then we will get greater ellipsoid volume it means polarizability is decreasing in this case also polarizability is decreasing so you get something like this curve when you plot alpha versus g and now again you can go at equilibrium position and look at the slope here again slope is zero what does that mean is for a small displacement d alpha by d e is equal to zero and what does that mean is for a small displacement there is no effective change in polarizability and what does that mean is that this mode is also raman inactive so basically you have to look at the change in polarizability around equilibrium around equilibrium and you must have to think about a small displacement and if slope is zero it means that, that particular mode is not raman active if slope is positive or negative it means polarizability is changing and when polarizability is changing means it is raman active so for co2 molecule we have looked at three different uh, vibration mode symmetrical stretching bending and asymmetrical stretching the first one is raman active but it is infrared inactive whereas bending and asymmetric stretching are inactive inactive modes in the raman spectroscopy whereas they are infrared active so conclusion is no vibration is simultaneously active in both raman and infrared and that leads to well known rule of mutual exclusion which says that if a molecule has a center of symmetry then raman active vibrations are infrared inactive and vice versa if there is no symmetry then some vibration may be both raman and infrared active converse is also true that is both raman and infrared are inactive then molecule has a center of symmetry so this rule of mutual exclusion is force molecule with a center of symmetry and when the molecule has center of symmetry then uh, either the mode is your uh, infrared active or raman active it cannot be both raman and infrared active molecule so this is all about theory part of uh, your ir spectroscopy now what we'll do is we'll look at the application and ir spectroscopy has wide range of application most important one is your identification of substance so most of the organic molecule uh, can be identified or particularly their functional group can be identified uh, through ir spectroscopy for that you need to just compare a spectrum of your sample and a reference sample uh, two identical two samples are not going to have identical ir spectrum so you take two molecules and you try to see their ir spectrum that is not going to be same you must certainly we are talking about when those two molecules are in identical conditions one disadvantage is that we cannot distinguish enantiomer fingerprint region 1500 to 400 cm is very important because even a small difference in structure and constitution molecule will show significant change in the peaks in the region and so it is very important tool ir is a very important tool to identify an unknown compound so i will give some examples to you so look at this molecule so here you have ch3 c double bond ch ch2 ch3 and this is a cis trans cis2 pentene and or trans2 pentene and you can see that there are a lot of differences in ir spectrum particularly you see this cis you have here and for trans it is here and similarly you can look at the stretching sp2 ch stretching sp3 ch stretching so just by looking at you know a spectrum of two pentene 
samples, you can tell that which two painting has cis configuration and which one has trans configuration. Now, uh, look at this your uh, 2, 3 hexane and this is your 2 pentane and 2, 3 hexanes, just a small change, one methyl group you have attached to this part and you see fingerprint region, it is totally different, fingerprint region is totally different. And so, just by looking at fingerprint region, you can tell about which molecule is present in the sample, no two molecules has identical IR spectrum. So, just by comparing with the uh, already available data in the literature, you can know uh, what molecule is there in the sample. This is very simple method, IR is very simple method to distinguish between two polymers. For example, polyacrylonitrile and polyethylene terephthalate, just visually you cannot distinguish it. But just looking at IR, you can distinguish between these two polymers because these two polymers and different functional group. In first one, you can see in polyacrylonitrile, there is nitrile group and nitrile group absorbs at 2250 centimeter inverse. You can get a band around 2250 centimeter inverse in IR spectrum if you have polyacrylonitrile sample. This polystyrene you have ester group. So, just by looking at frequency absorption of ester group which is around 1735 centimeter inverse, you can know that whether you have polyethylene terephthalate or polyacrylonitrile. So, two polymers can be distinguished using IR spectroscopy. I will give few more examples. For example, natural rubber and butyl rubber. We can differentiate between these two different kind of rubber because natural rubber is your polymer of isoprene which has a double bond, whereas butyl rubber is your polymer of isobutylene and you see here there is no double bond and uh, your uh, in natural rubber you can see a band around 1630 centimeter inverse which will not be present in a butyl rubber. Similarly, we can distinguish between polyethylene and polyestyrene. Uh, as you can see that polyethylene is your polymer of uh, uh, ethylene molecule, where is polyestyrene, polymer of a styrene molecule and a styrene has a aromatic benzene ring, aromatic benzene ring. And for aromatic benzene ring, CH comes above 3000 centimeter inverse, whereas for aliphatic CH bond, your band comes below 3000 centimeter inverse. So, just by looking at simple IR spectrum of these two polymers, we can distinguish your two different, uh, these two different polymers. We can also distinguish between cellophane and polypropylene. Again, cellophane is a polymer of cellulose acetate, whereas polypropylene is polymer of one propylene, one propylene. So, now you can look at in cellophane, you have acetate group which shows an absorption band around 1710 centimeter inverse, whereas for polyethylene, this single band comes around 2900 centimeter inverse. So, just by looking at simple IR spectrum, you can distinguish between these two polymers. So, this is about finding out whether molecule or identify the molecule in the sample. The second thing is we can even uh, get a structure of the compound using IR and for that we need to combine this with other spectroscopic technique like NMR UV visible. Particularly, Functional group can be very easily identified by use of IR spectroscopy. For example, uh, CO carbonyl band absorbs around 17, 17, 1717 uh, centimeter inverse, 
whereas you can find a bond around 3400 centimeter inverse if molecule has OH group. And absence of band of that particular group indicates absence of that functional group in the compound. So, for functional group prediction, IR is one of the most suitable and easiest method. One example I have already given that you know you can uh, distinguish between two different isomers. Here again, there is a one case where you uh, have since cis and trans isomer of 3 hexane and that can be distinguished by looking at the fingerprint region. In cis 3 hexane, you will get out of plane CH deformation band near 970 centimeter inverse, whereas in trans 3 hexane, you will get CH deformation band near 700 centimeter inverse. So, cis and trans can be distinguished by use of IR spectroscopy. The third application is monitoring the progress of reaction. A reaction progress can be simply monitored by using IR spectroscopy and it is quite simple. You can either look at disappearance of characteristic absorption band of reactants or you can look at increasing rate of increasing absorption band of a particular product. So, for example, if uh, we are looking at this transformation from alcohol to keto group, so reactant has OH functional group. So, you can look at rate of disappearance of alcohol and then you can study the kinetics. Whereas, you can also look at uh, increase in absorption bond of CO to look at the monitoring of progress of reaction. So, suppose band around 3600 to 35 centimeter inverse disappears, then you know that your reaction is come. Similarly, uh, there is second example we, uh, where uh, we can look at the progress of reaction. So, this is simply hydrolysis in presence of aqueous NOH. Uh, so, you can see that there is NS2 group and there is a C n bond. So, there is a C n bond. So, this C n bond absorbs around 1100 centimeter inverse and this is in the reactant and now that is missing in your product, missing in your product. In product, you have uh, keto group converting to your S, uh, this C o o minus group. So, what you will see with the progress of reaction that absorption band due to C n bond will di disappear, whereas your sharp band as 1670 centimeter inverse, which is because of CO bond, CO bond in amide will shift to higher side, because now you are going from CO bond in amide to CO bond in ester, CO bond in ester and CO bond in ester basically absorbs at higher higher uh, wave number. Apart from these three, we can also detect the impurities contaminants and this is very important for particularly for quality of sample, looking at quality of the sample. Generally what we do is we compare sample spectrum with spectrum of pure reference compound and by that we can know whether there is impurity or not. People try to look at ketone impurity in alcohols. So, most of the alcohols has ketone impurity and just by looking at the absorption band of C double bond O, we can know whether that impurity exists or not and we can also do quantitative analysis. Generally, detection is favored when impurity possesses a strong band in IR region, whereas main substance do not possess a band, then only we can. So, for example, a, when we are looking comparing between ketone and alcohol, uh, ketone has a band due to CO, whereas alcohol has a band due to OH, which is absent in uh, each other. Okay, so, uh, there is one example where contaminant extracted from a filter of air conditioner was looked at 
and it was tried to find out whether that contaminant is due to mineral oil or cooking oil. So, generally mineral oil consists of higher alkanes whereas, uh, cooking oil has various saturated, un unsaturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fats. So, if you know this difference of structure, then you know that cooking oil must have your absorption band due to unsaturation. And if your contaminant is from cooking oil, you will see a strong absorption band at 1735 centimeter inverse and that is because of unsaturation. Thus, contaminant if we see that uh, there is a band around 1735 centimeter inverse, then contaminant must be, uh, contaminant could be cooking oil. So, the next uh, application of IR spectroscopy is determination of the bond strength. So, IR stretching frequency, you know that it is given by 1 by 2 pi root k by mu, where k is spin constant and mu is reduced mass of the atom. So, now again uh, mu is related to R, your uh, mu is related to R, whereas k is related to bond strength. So, just by looking at k, you can know that whether or by looking at k, you can determine the bond strength. So, if bond strength is high, then k is going to be high. So, by knowing the stretching frequency from the experiment, we can calculate the stiffness of a particular bond. There are other applications, for example, if we are trying to look at blood glucose level and we generally know whenever we go to uh, uh, hospital, they take your blood and then look at your, uh, then do some testing to know the blood glucose level. Okay. So, uh, for that you require a new test strip and that uh, increases the cost of such a device. This is a non-invasive technique and uh, here your wavelength of 15, 15 nanometer is chosen due to high signal to noise ratio for glucose signal. So, in this IR transmission, uh, your uh, instrument is basically used across the ear lobe to measure glucose. So, you do not need a blood sample and basically what is done is that a light source and a light detector is placed on either side of ear lobe and then amount of near IR light passing through the ear lobe depend on the amount of blood glucose in that region. So, ear lobe was chosen due to absence of bone tissue and also because of its relative small thickness. So, in this case, uh, you can see that you know without taking the blood sample, we can know what is the glucose level in the blood. So, there are lot of other applications of IR spectroscopy and in the next lecture, we will discuss uh, some of them and, uh, uh, but one thing is clear that, you know, for a chemical molecule, uh, IR spectroscopy, for analysis of chemical molecule, IR spectroscopy is must and it is a, your non-invasive technique and then, uh, you know, it can easily, very easily tell you about the functional group of the molecule. Thank you.